Thank you for listening to our church podcast, where it is our joy to share helpful truths from the Bible. We pray this serves as one more tool to help develop leaders within our church and community who love and honor Jesus and reveal it by loving others. If you have any questions or comments about any of the messages, we invite you to join us on any Wednesday, 6 p.m., for a group discussion on the passages and sermons found here. Scripture reading this morning will be found in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 12. We will read verses 1 through 12. I will read the first verse, and then after you join in with me on the second verse, and continue with me every other, other verse. It's Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. Would you please stand if we read these verses? In the meantime, when so many thousands of the people have gathered together, that they were trampling one another, began to say to his disciples, First, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. Whatever you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the hilltops. I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And the five sparrows sold for two pennies, and not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs, hairs of your head all are numbered. For ye fear not. You are of more value than many sparrows. And I tell you, everyone who acknowledged me before men, the Son of Man also will acknowledge before the angels of God. But the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. But the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. And when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you are to say. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit be upon the congregation today as we listen to the message given by the pastor and that we learn from this message. We ask this in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We are continuing our journey with Jesus, uh, working our way through the Gospel of Luke. And last week we read a story about Jesus uh, crashing a dinner party at a Pharisee's house. Those of you who are here uh, will remember the Pharisee got uh, very offended at the fact that Jesus did not uphold their traditions, and Jesus responded basically by pointing out the uh, hollow nature of the Pharisees' faith. They looked good on the outside, but were filthy on the inside. And today's text is really a continuation of the same ideas. Uh, we'll see that with the very first words in verse chapter 1. You see it says, in the meantime. Uh, so this text takes place immediately following what we talked about uh, last Sunday. This is an ongoing discussion about the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. So in the meantime, uh, when so many thousands of people had gathered together, they were trampling one another. Many thousands of people. The crowds are growing. Uh, Jesus is very popular, of course, among the people. Uh, anybody that could perform miracles like he did, of course, would very quickly gain a following. Uh, and this, uh, these arguments with the Pharisees also seem to be adding interest to Christ. People are Some people are just there for the show. Uh, they just want to see uh, what's going to happen next. And so uh, many thousands of people are here. They're trampling, tripping over each other, trying to get close enough to hear Jesus teach. In other words, there was zero social distancing take place here. Okay, these people were, were all over each other, and it was actually becoming uh, a dangerous situation. And Jesus uh, begins to say to his disciples, notice he's talking to his followers. So verses 1 through 12 are all addressed uh, to the disciples of Jesus. Notice the first word Jesus says there, beware. Okay, so he's about to warn them of something to be on guard about, something to be afraid of, something to 
watch out for. Before we see what we're supposed to be watching out for, I want to point out a few other statements throughout these 12 verses. Uh, Verse 5 says, I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Okay, so that's a couple of times already there in the text that we're commanded to fear something. Uh, Be on guard, beware of something, and then in this case, fear someone. Okay, verse uh, verse 4 then says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear. Uh, Do not fear those who can kill the body. Okay, and then verse 7, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not. You are of uh, more value than many sparrows. And then finally, verse 11 says, uh, when they bring you before the synagogues, the rulers and authorities, do not be anxious, which is another way of saying, uh, don't fear. And so we have three commands to fear, to beware, uh, to watch out for something, followed by three commands to not fear. Uh, Don't be afraid. Don't be anxious. And so clearly then this text, the main theme of it is fear. Uh, This is a text about who to fear and who not to fear, uh, what to beware of and what not to be anxious about. And somehow all of that has something to do with hypocrisy because we notice the first line uh, back in verse 1, Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And so that's sort of the, uh, the topic sentence, the opening line for the rest of this teaching. Okay, so we have fear and don't fear, and in the middle there somewhere is hypocrisy. And so we're first going to talk about uh, this first line. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is, which is hypocrisy. So first we're going to talk about leaven, what leaven is. Then we're going to talk about what the leaven of the Pharisees is referring to. And then we're going to talk about how is that hypocrisy? How does that lead to uh, hypocritical living? So let's take those one at a time. First, leaven is yeast. Now, we don't make bread uh, ourselves nowadays. Most of us just go to a store and pick up a loaf of bread. But in that culture, you made your own bread. Uh, Each family was very accustomed to, you know, you get your flour and whatever else you put in bread. You can tell I haven't made bread before. Um, And they would mix in yeast because basically the difference between a cracker and and bread is yeast right? That's what makes it rise. That's what makes it fluffy instead of uh, a thin little hard thing. And so you get some, uh, your ingredients and you mix in a small amount of leaven, which permeates through the whole lump and makes the bread rise. Uh, Leaven makes a huge difference. Um, Paul said in Galatians 5, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. This is a principle that's found numerous times in the New Testament. This illustration of leaven, Uh, And the idea there is whatever Jesus is saying, watch out for this leaven of the Pharisees, it permeates through everything they do. Uh, Just like yeast, you know, you mix in a tiny bit of it into your lump and the whole thing is is yeasted, however you make that a verb. Um, The whole thing is affected by this tiny bit of yeast. And so a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It alters their whole religion. This this leaven of the Pharisees, it changes their religion drastically. So now what is the leaven of the Pharisees? Well, luckily for us, this is not the only place Jesus talks about this. And so we can look at the other texts and understand what he's talking about. He defines it in Matthew 16. How is it, he says, that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So the leaven of the Pharisees is their teaching. Watch out for the teaching of the Pharisees. Beware of the corrupt teaching and influence of the Pharisees. Back to our text, verse 1. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So watch out. Be on guard. The teaching of the Pharisees is dangerous because it leads to hypocrisy. Their religious practices and teachings lead to a hypocritical attitude that's all about externals and has zero heart. This is what we talked about last week. Jesus saw, uh, said about the Pharisees uh, that they were like cups or dishes that looked clean on the outside but were filthy on the inside. Uh, they looked righteous to everybody watching, but inside they were wicked. They appeared to be holy people, godly people, because they had all of these traditions and they upheld these religious practices. They went to synagogue. uh, They read the Old Testament. They did all of the outward actions that would make them seem to be godly people. But inside, they were sinful. They were wicked. And so Jesus says to his disciples, watch out. 
He tells his disciples this because he's well aware of the fact that we can drift into this very kind of thinking if we're not careful. Again, he's not talking to the Pharisees here. He's talking to the disciples, saying, watch out, because you are in danger of becoming just like them. As we've studied week after week through Luke's gospel, it's been shocking to me how often this theme comes up. The hypocrisy of the Pharisees is one of the main themes uh, throughout the gospel of Luke. Over and over and over again, Luke brings up the fact that the Pharisees were hypocrites, and Jesus continues to point out the hollow nature of their religion. And so that should lead us to ask a question about this repetition. Why does Luke keep bringing this up? Why does he include so many stories about Jesus rebuking the Pharisees? And I think the answer is that this is something we need a continual reminder of. We as Christians are in constant danger of becoming hypocrites. We can act religious. We can appear to be spiritual. We can impress people with our long, fancy prayers and our church attendance and whatever else. But on the inside, we can be filthy. And Jesus knows that this is a possibility, so he warns us to watch out for this. And the whole rest of this text is a series of reasons for why you shouldn't be a hypocrite. First reason is in verse 2. Nothing, Jesus says, is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Uh, Don't be a hypocrite because God will one day reveal you to be the fake that you are. You might fool me, you might fool your family, you might fool everybody at your church, but you won't fool God. He will reveal each one of us for what we are in the inside. Verse 3 continues, Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. On judgment day, the real you is the only thing that will matter. So beware. Watch out. Watch out for hypocrisy. Uh, Keep in mind when you choose to sin and you think nobody sees you, so it doesn't matter. Just remember, it will come out one day. Our our English word for hypocrite comes from a Greek Greek word, hupokrisos, which was a word used for an actor. Uh, Back in ancient times, pretty much the only entertainment you had was uh, you'd go to a play and you'd see actors perform some sort of a play on stage. And so these actors would have masks that they would hold over their face uh, to put on a certain character in the play, to play a certain role. And sometimes one actor would play multiple roles in the play. And so he would have a couple of different masks. He would have one when he's this character, and then he'd put this other one on when he's a different character. And that's where the word hypocrite comes from, two-faced. You have one mask you put on at one time, and then you have another one you put on for another time. So to be a hypocrite is to be two-faced. In the case of the Pharisees, They acted pious and religious around people, but in their hearts, they were frauds. Uh, We could say backstage, they were filthy, they were sinners. And Jesus says, watch out for the hypocrisy in your own life, because there is coming a day when God will unmask every hypocrite, and you will be seen for who you really are. Knowing of this day of revealing is coming should impact the way that we live our lives now. And Jesus gives another reason in verse 4, to beware of hypocrisy. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And so here's the heart of the text. Uh, Don't be a hypocrite, which Jesus defines here as one who fears man and not God. No hypocrite has a healthy fear of God, but all hypocrites fear men. In other words, what caused the Pharisees to be hypocrites is that they were more concerned with what other people thought of them than they were about what God thought of them. So they made sure that they looked good and righteous and holy on the outside with no concern about how sinful and wicked they were on the inside, because after all, only God can see that. Have you ever heard the phrase, Uh, Only God can judge me. Talk about a stupid thing to say. Uh, Only God can judge me. Uh, God is the one being in the universe who is perfect and has absolute standards of righteousness. It should terrify us that God can judge us. So don't fear men. Uh, Who cares what what they think of you? Ultimately, Jesus says the worst thing a human can do to you is take your life. You should be far more concerned 
with the one who will determine your eternal destiny. Don't fear those who can kill the body and then after that they have nothing more they can do, he says. Instead, fear the one who determines whether you go to heaven or hell. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't try to impress everybody else around you in life. Instead, be concerned about the one whose throne, uh, before whose throne you will stand on judgment day. And now at this point, Jesus begins to transition. He's been talking about hypocrisy and the fear of man versus the fear of God. And here he shifts to talking about persecution. Okay, and we, we, we know we shouldn't fear men because what they can do to us, rather we should be concerned about God's opinion of us. But Jesus doesn't sugarcoat the reality that following him may cost these disciples their lives. But even if they are persecuted and killed for their stand for Christ, he says you shouldn't fear men. You should keep your focus on God. Verse 6, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. And in other contexts, Jesus says when a sparrow, a little bird, falls in the forest, God sees it. This is talking about the basically the close watch that God has over everything that takes place in creation. Verse 7, he continues, Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. I wish for some of us is difficult. For others, I could probably tell you how many you have. But uh, beside the point, uh, verse 7, Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of more value than many sparrows. Don't fear in times of persecution because God is not distant. He sees you. Uh, God knows when a bird dies in the middle of some uninhabited forest and God knows how many hairs are on your head. He, he sees how you're living. And if we suffer for Christ, we can know that our faithfulness to him will be rewarded. Verse eight, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before men, the son of man also will acknowledge before the angels of God, but the one who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. Fear of God should make you fearless of what men can do to you. Jesus is saying here, you disciples are going to suffer for being my followers. Uh, you're, and you're going to have to make the decision whether you're going to cave to the pressure and deny me or stay committed and face the consequences. And what would cause somebody to die instead of deny Christ? What would cause somebody to have that type of fearless uh, faithfulness to the Lord. Nothing would lead to that kind of fearlessness except a greater concern with what God thought of them. Hypocrites don't die for their religion. If it's just an outward show to impress people, you'll crumble as soon as our culture is against your faith. But if it's real, if you follow Jesus out of a concern to please him and not men, then you'll stay strong throughout the tests of your faith and persecution. There were many in Jesus' day who believed in him but would not confess him openly because they feared men more than God. These were the worst of the hypocrites. John 12, verse 42 says, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They feared man more than God. They were more concerned with being well thought of and being accepted in the synagogues, so much so that they would not take a bold stand for Christ. And Jesus says very plainly to these hypocrites, you deny me now and I'll deny you later. You, you deny me now and then someday you want to claim me in heaven? I'll say to you, I never knew you. Depart from me. But if you confess me now, I'll confess you later. And so when persecution comes, we should remember that they can only kill the body, right? That human beings can't determine our ultimate destiny, but God can. And so we should fear him more. Don't fear man, fear God and stay strong. And this was a very real threat uh, to the early disciples of Jesus. They would very soon uh, face real persecution from these very same religious people who hated Jesus and put him to death. And their comfort was that if they would claim Jesus now, even if it should cost them their life, Jesus would claim them as his on Judgment Day. Verse 10, he continues, Everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but the one who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, what is that about? Uh, everyone who speaks a word against Jesus will be forgiven. I, I thought they just said that uh, they'd be denied before the angels of God. And if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you can't be forgiven. What, what is this about? 
I think this statement of Jesus is an appeal to some to repent. They had spoken against Christ. They had rejected Jesus so far. And he says, you can be forgiven for that. It's not too late for you. There were some in the crowd who had not believed in Jesus and had rejected his message. In fact, we're told later, uh, even some of his own family members rejected him. But then later, after his resurrection, they did repent and they believed and they were forgiven. So that sin could be forgiven. You can reject Jesus and later repent and be forgiven. As for the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, I think we have to remember the incident back in chapter 11 to make sense of that. You remember when Jesus casts out a demon from a man in chapter 11, uh, the Pharisees start spreading this rumor that he's actually possessed of Satan, uh, that it's by the power of Beelzebul that Jesus is able to uh, have this miracle ability. That is the blasphemy of the Spirit. We know this because the parallel account uh, makes clear that this is what's being referred to. Mark 3, 28. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. So those Pharisees who claimed that Jesus was demon-possessed had committed an unforgivable sin. They had come face to face with Jesus' power and his miracles, and they refused to repent. But instead, they claimed that he was possessed of Satan, and they could never be forgiven for this blasphemy. This is obstinate rejection of the message and testimony of Jesus. Jesus concludes his teaching to the disciples with these instructions, verse 11. When they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about how you should defend yourself, or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Again, uh, these disciples very soon would suffer persecution. Uh, The vast majority of them would be killed, uh, 10 out of the original 12. Judas, of course, uh, betrays Christ and kills himself ultimately. But uh, of the 11 left, 10 of them died as martyrs. They would be brought on trial before the religious leaders and even some of the civil authorities. You think Uh, In the book of Acts, we see several instances like this, where Stephen is on trial before the Sanhedrin, and then he's ultimately sentenced to stoning. Uh, Paul stands before Felix and Festus and King Agrippa. Uh, Many instances like this in the book of Acts, where Christians are put on trial, uh, imprisoned, and sometimes killed because of their commitment to Christ. And Jesus says, don't be anxious about what you're going to say when they put you on trial. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. I think the point here is, if you are a genuine follower of Jesus and not just a fake hypocrite, you will be kept by the power of God. You will endure to the end. You won't deny Christ. You don't have to feel anxiety and wonder, uh, will I hold to Christ in times of those trials and persecution? Because it isn't up to you to hold. Uh, The Spirit is the seal of your eternity, and you're in His grip. How else can you reconcile these two statements? Fear the one who can cast you into hell for denying him, but also don't be anxious about denying him in times of persecution. Those seem like contradictions, but let's put this in the context. The point of all 12 verses is what Jesus said at the start. Don't be a hypocrite. Beware of hypocrisy. Don't be a fake because you'll be exposed during persecution. In other words, if you're just an outward Christian, uh, if you do all of the church stuff, you look real good on the outside, but there's no inner reality to your commitment and devotion to Christ, that will be exposed in times of testing and persecution. And it will ultimately be exposed when you stand before God and every hidden thing is revealed. And when that is revealed, you will be denied by the Son and cast into hell by the Father. But... If you aren't a hypocrite, if you're a a true disciple of Christ, one who loves Jesus and wants to serve him out of a sincere heart of devotion, and you're not not concerned with with what other people around you think of you, you're concerned with what Christ thinks of you. You're trying to please God and not impress men. If you're a real follower of Jesus, you don't have to be anxious about persecution because your real faith will prevail. Not because you're anything special but because the Holy Spirit is holding your faith and he's keeping you. So don't be anxious about how you'll respond in times of testing. Instead, be anxious about whether or not you're a hypocrite. You get that. Testing 
simply reveals what's true on the inside. Uh, hypocritical Christians, they deny Christ when testing comes. When times are tough, uh, they abandon him, and they will face his judgment. True followers that aren't hypocrites won't fall in times of testing, but will pass the test. And then they will be vindicated for their commitment to Christ. And so the thing each one of us needs to be concerned with is which one are you? Are you a true follower of Jesus or a hypocrite? Maybe the best way to answer that question is to ask another question. Do you try to impress people or please God? Do you fear God or man? I want to read now the, the parallel account. Matthew 10 has a lot of the same information as Luke's, but in a different order. And there's a few extra things here. So let's just walk through this text kind of as a review of what we've seen thus far. Matthew 10, starting verse 19. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. A brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and the children will rise against the parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all, by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. In other words, deny me now, I'll deny you later. Stay faithful to me now, and I'll claim you for all of eternity. Verse 23. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher, and the servant like his master. Now notice this, if they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So Jesus says, if you're my followers, expect to be treated like I am. Uh, these people are calling me Satan, they're going to slander you too. Uh, Jesus, of course, ultimately was killed by these religious leaders. So we can expect the same uh, persecution against us. Verse 26, so have no fear of them. Now that seems really strange when you first read it. Uh, they persecuted me and they'll persecute you if you're a follower of mine. So don't fear them. Uh, that seems kind of backwards. Like, wouldn't it make more sense to say they mistreated me and if you follow me, they'll mistreat you too. So you should fear them. But instead, Jesus says the opposite. This is somehow a, a reason not to fear them. And I think the answer is, if you are persecuted for following Christ, that should give you assurance that you're a true follower. You're, you're not a hypocrite, because they don't, they don't mind hypocrites like themselves. If you're being persecuted, that is evidence of the fact that you are truly a follower of Jesus. So don't fear them. And then notice the rest. For nothing is covered that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. So the second reason not to fear is every hidden thing will be known. In other words, don't, feel, don't fear when people try to persecute you because you will one day be vindicated. Verse 27, what I tell you in the dark, say in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops and do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't let persecution of men cause you to abandon God. Fear God more than man. If you turn against God uh, out of a fear of man, that's a very foolish choice. Because all they can do is persecute you in your physical life now. God is the one who determines your eternal destiny. And then verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So don't fear because God sees you and will reward you on judgment day for your boldness and faithfulness instead of fearing man and betraying him. Verse 32, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I, will, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. God sees your faithfulness. God also sees if you abandon him. So boldly proclaim Christ and fear God, not other people. I see in that, that text that we just read, five reasons not to fear men. Uh, don't fear, and specifically he's telling them, don't fear the persecution of men who oppose you for being a follower of mine for these five reasons. Number one, that is evidence that you're with Jesus. We don't need to fear 
when persecution comes for being a follower of Christ, uh, because that's the way they treated Christ. And that should actually cause us to rejoice that, hey, this is uh, kind of a sign that I'm with Jesus because I'm suffering the same persecution he did. Number two, don't fear the persecution of men because one day you'll be vindicated. God will reveal one day the, the hypocrites for who they are and the true followers for who they are. So don't fear. Number three, don't fear because they can't ultimately hurt you. The worst that they can do is afflict you in this life and uh, usher you into heaven. They can't affect you ultimately. Number four, don't fear because God can. Uh, one of the motivations for staying faithful to Christ is the reality of hell. The fact that if we deny Christ, if we abandon him, uh, God will deny us ultimately. Number five, don't fear because God is watching you and is providentially caring for you, even through trials. Again, this is in the context of affliction and persecution, he says. Uh, my father's watching you, just like he watches the sparrows that fall, uh, just like he knows how many hairs are on your head. He is watching you. And he's providentially caring for you. So don't fear. In this text, Jesus is drawing a line in the sand between following him and following the Pharisees. Though there would be trials and persecutions for followers of Jesus, following the Pharisees leads to hell. And so he says, beware of hypocrisy. There is nothing more dangerous. Hypocrisy is a sin that will lead you to hell. And by hypocrisy, I mean fearing man and not God, living to impress others or please others instead of living to please God. Uh, going through the motions of church and prayer and whatever other uh, religious things you may do will not save your soul. Only a true follower will be saved. Only one who is a Christian inwardly. Again, you can fool me, you can fool a lot of people, uh, but you will not fool God and the truth will be revealed. Now let's close with some uh, practicality. I feel like over the last few weeks, I've basically just been saying, don't be a Pharisee. <laughs> That's what each one of these texts seems to be about. Pharisees bad, don't be like them. Uh, but I haven't really given you how to do that, practical steps to avoid that hypocrisy. So how can we do battle with the hypocritical tendencies that we have? Here are a few ways. Number one, remember that you're a sinner. Maybe another way to say that is, don't be impressed with yourself. When you start to think that you're more righteous than everybody else, watch out. Because it won't be long before you're trying to maintain that, uh, that outward image of righteousness when the inner reality is far more ugly. Luke 18, verse 9, Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. So the first step to fighting hypocrisy is to remember that you are a sinner. Number two, focus on your sins, not everybody else's. Luke 6, 41, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, uh, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. If you want to not be a hypocrite, focus on your sins. Examine your own lives, not everybody else's. Number three, stop trying to be impressive and instead seek to please God. Luke 20, verse 46, Jesus said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. These scribes and Pharisees were all about impressing other people. They dressed 
in very fancy ways. I kind of think of like the old medieval popes with the big hats and the long robes, uh, just trying to let everybody around them know I'm a religious person. And they loved sitting on the platforms in the synagogue. They loved uh, these long prayers where everybody would watch them. And Jesus says, stop trying to be impressive to everybody else and instead be concerned with what God thinks. Number four, and this kind of has some overlap, don't draw attention to the good things that you do. If you really want to fight being a hypocrite, you don't want to turn into a hypocrite like the Pharisees, don't draw attention to the good things that you do. Matthew 6, verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Uh, you remember in that text where Jesus says, you know, they, they come to him saying, Lord, Lord, we did all of these great things in your name. And he says, I never knew you. Uh, there are many people who they do these great things. And some of them are truly good actions to do. But their motivation is to please others. Hypocrites love when people see them doing something good. In fact, the only time a hypocrite does something godly is when people are there to see it. And so if you want to fight hypocrisy in your own heart, do good without others knowing. And along those lines, there's, I kind of have three sub-points under that, if you will. Uh, number five, give privately. Let's talk about financial donations. Uh, Matthew 6, verse 2. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now don't try to impress people with your charity. This is one reason, personally, I really like online giving here at our church, uh, because you can give online. I, I, if I had my way, I'd like to get rid of the offering plates. Um, and I know some people like to give cash and checks. I get all that. But uh, I, I like the idea of getting away from, oh, everybody's watching me give. And the online giving, for me anyway, and this is just a personal preference. I'm not bashing you if you give in the offering plates, okay? Uh, but for me personally, I like to give online because nobody sees it, right? Uh, it's just a way to avoid hypocrisy is by giving without trying to impress anybody, without worrying about anybody else seeing you. I've even seen some people... Uh, go as far as to put in empty offering envelopes in the plate because they want everybody to see them giving, but they're not actually giving. <laughs> that is the ultimate hypocrisy. When you're so concerned about what everybody else thinks with no concern of what God thinks. And so when you give, when you give financial contributions, do so privately. Number six, pray in secret. Again, Matthew 6, verse 5. When you pray, Jesus says, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Hypocrites don't pray to God alone. They pray openly where somebody can hear them or at least see them and know that they're praying. Uh, they want to impress others. And so if you want to fight hypocrisy, Jesus says, pray secretly to your Father when nobody sees you, when nobody's around. Number seven, this is sort of a, a recap of all of these points. Be your most spiritual when nobody but God is watching you. I thought for a while of how to word that. I'm not sure, sure if that's the best way of wording it. But it, gets, it kind of gets the main idea across behind all of these. The most godly things you do should be known only to you and God. The bulk of your prayers should be prayed when nobody knows you're praying. The good things that you do should be done without observation from others. This is how to fight hypocrisy. Matthew 23, verse 25, we'll end with these verses. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Stop worrying about the outside of the cup that everybody else sees and start being concerned with what God sees. Because the true test of your Christianity is how you live when nobody else but your father is watching. 
That's when it's clear if you're a hypocrite or a true follower of Christ. So beware of hypocrisy. We hope the message you just heard was helpful to you. It means a lot to us that you would join us for this podcast. For more information about our church and meeting times, visit lbcmiller.com or call us at 219-885-9303. We would love to hear from you.